um, everybody. Session. Mm-hmm. All right, say, say it again. I'm the only person on. Uh, well, I think I should be joining in a few minutes. Um, okay, I was just wondering if mm-hmm. there's something wrong with my my iPad. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So now we'll begin. Uh, welcome everyone to today's medical ministry action plan. We're so glad that you've joined us today for today's medical ministry uh, action plan discussion. And we have a very important topic again to talk about. And we're going to be looking at opportunities for ministry in our medical institutions, or in the hospitals and our sanitariums. And that is, um, we're, we're progressing in our sections um, each time. And now we're in section 10. I mean, so that is amazing uh, how we're based over halfway through the book. <laughs> and we've learned a lot regarding management of the sanitariums. And we looked at that last week in detail. And we've learned a lot of very practical, important lessons that would help us out as we go forth and do the work in these times. So today we have another important discussion and let's get right into today's discussion. So, um, uh, Ms. Cornwall, would you uh, have prayer for us if you don't mind? Sure. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much, first of all, for the Sabbath, a day of rest, of refreshment, of learning, of worship, of celebration. We thank you for the opportunities that are being provided for us, for the Adventist Association of Global Evangelists. Would you be with us, Lord, as we discuss this very important topic. We thank you for the guidance that you have provided through your servant, Ellen White. So kindly watch over us as we talk about plans for the future. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So again, we have a very important topic today. So would you mind uh, just give us an interview, uh, overview rather, of, of today's study. Well, the title is really self-explanatory where it talks about the opportunities that um, for ministry for hospitals and sanitariums, there's a lot of opportunities for the Christian physician to minister to the patient. And that's the reason why um, God wants sanitariums to be established in the first place is to spread the gospel. To me, a means of spreading the gospel. And it's a very good um, tool. The health work is a very good tool. It's the arm, the right hand to the gospel. And um, it's a very good tool to use in spreading the gospel. It opens doors to hearts that might be closed otherwise but it helps them when they're healed physically and um, you're able to talk with this patient because they're sick and they're thinking about um, what must I do to be saved? Because you can point them to Christ and you don't want to lose that opportunity as a physician, never lose the opportunity. Okay. So we have a, we're going to be looking at how we can use these sanitariums for ministry. We've looked at the, um, the, purpose of the medical machinery work and we saw that it was threefold in nature you know yes it we heal physically you know through christ but also we have a very important spiritual aspect that we can't forget we've talked about that in the past but we're looking at some practical uh, opportunities for ministry and we're going to look at some things that can hinder that and so uh, let's get this discussion. And so first of all, we're going to look at the ministry of the institution. It says here, he desires our health institution to stand as a witness for the truth. They are to give character to the work, which must be carried forth in these last days. 
and restoring man through a reformation of habits, appetites, and passions. Seventh-day Adventists are to be represented to the world by the advanced principles of health reform, which God has given us. In our sanitariums, no day should be allowed to pass without something being done for the salvation of souls. We are to offer special prayers for the sick, both when with them and with when away from them. Then, when they inquire about the remedy for sin, our own souls, softened by the Holy Spirit, will glow with a desire to help them give their hearts to God. And there is another quote that goes right along with that. It says, it is God's purpose that our health institution shall become very effectual means for bringing souls to the light of truth. Much more should be done to encourage. Only when we do our best for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom can the words be spoken to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Only as we exemplify the spirit of truth in our lives can Christ's spirit work with us to convict hearts and convert souls to the gospel. And that's Medical Ministry, page 195. And so here we see that God desires our institutions to stand as witnesses for the truth, and we can't let, let a day pass uh, by without it being witness for the truth. And having an institution, especially in this world of uh, immorality, having an institution that stands for true Christian principles and true Christian values is of so much importance in our time. You know, there, there's not many places, not many businesses, not many organizations all the world that stand and sincere about their religious beliefs and uh, and exemplifying the teachings of of the gospel and so having that is just so important and being that witness and having that standard actually really has influence on everyone no matter if they're you know, they don't believe in God, if they're Buddhist, Hindu, whatever they may be, it has influence in everyone. Because that is what Christ had. He had influence, and it was influence that people loved, um, that many loved to be around, because it was a true, sincere, and pure experience. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really important, and even and just um, in daily reactions and you know business and things like that, uh, you see how it is important to exemplify Christ. And when you uh, in in a business and especially Christian business and industry, you, know, you get to meet a lot of various people that are um, from various um, from various walks of life. Like recently. I even had a pastor of one of the largest churches in our area who I never met before. Uh, I met him. Uh, <laughs> you, we were, uh, he was coming at wood from our sawmill, and it happened to be the pastor of a very large church. I would say probably the largest church in our county. Uh, it's definitely one of the biggest buildings in the entire town. <laughs> and... Um, and he was, uh, he came once and then he came later on and he was, began to follow us and uh, on Facebook and, you know, he wants to, you know, learn more about us and, and I bet he knows a whole lot about us because he did a ton of research on us, you know, before uh, we met him. But uh, it's an amazing thing in being a positive influence for truth and, and for right. And there's not many places, there's not many businesses or any place in the world that has, that have those um, principles that we should see in our health institutions. And like um, Ellen White said that business and ministry are two separate things. They're supposed to be blended together. So in business, um, always include Christ and use it as a ministering tool too exactly and so that that is our that is that also speed our health institutions and just imagine you know when people 
when people that are sick and when people that are in need of help, when people are at the lowest point in their lives, when they see the an institution that is sincerely upholding principles of Christianity, upholding principles of honesty and righteousness in the midst of a dishonest and unjust world, they will have an influence. An influence will, strong influence will be pressed upon their mind and this could be influence that they don't forget. Um, and, you know, especially at the time when, when most of the medical institutions of the world don't, um, are, they, they, they don't reflect those standards, even supposedly Christian medical institutions. So that is so powerful. We have to understand the power of that influence, that godly influence. Now, it's very important, very important to have this influence. Now, how do these institutions become effectual agents? Because we saw that it is God's purpose that our health institutions shall become very effectual means for bringing souls to the light of truth. So how do these institutions, how do our institutions become effectual agents for bringing souls to the light of truth? We, we talked about the influence, but how do we get that influence? How does an institution practically obtain that influence? And so that's the question, first question we're going to ask. And so how do we, how does an institution become effectual agents for, um, for bringing its souls to, to the truth? Well, it says in <laughs> the medical ministry, page 188, paragraph three, through the sanctification of the truth, God makes physicians and nurses skillful in a knowledge of how to treat the sick. And this work is opening the fast closed doors of many hearts. Men and women are led to see and understand the truth which is needed to save the soul as well as the body. This is an element that gives character to the work for this time. So, um, when they give the truth to the soul, they're becoming effective um, in their ministry. Also, it says in medical ministry, page 191, paragraph three, the sick will be led to Christ by the patient attention of nurses who anticipate their wants and who bow in prayer and ask the great medical missionary to look with compassion upon the sufferer and to let the soothing influence of his grace be felt and his restoring power be exercised. And then the uh, medical ministry page 192 paragraph one says, the nervous timidity of the sick will be overcome as they are made acquainted with the intensive interest that the savior has for all suffering humanity. All the death of the love of Christ to redeem us from death. He died on the cross of Calvary. So to become effective agents in the medical missionary work is to use the medical missionary work as a tool of evangelism. And don't forget to um, spread to them the gospel and point them to Jesus Christ because what an opportunity you have and don't let the opportunity pass by. Amen. And one thing I get from the last quote, it says about uh, the nervous timidity of the sick will be overcome as they are accounted with the intensive interest that the Savior has for all suffering humanity. And so in order to become an effectual agent, we have to create an environment in our institution that will produce and account those people uh, with an intensive interest that Christ has for us to save us. We need to show people the intensive love of Christ to our humanity. And that has to be demonstrated. It has to be preached about how Christ intensely wants to save us. And if as the patients understand that, I think that will have a very big impact, a profound impact upon them, you know, as they see the intensive interest that Christ has for them and uh, what he did. He gave all, and that is amazing. And as they see that intense 
interest that Christ has for them, it leads them to trust them. Amen. Amen. And so to develop that atmosphere, to produce that, uh, to mm -hmm. account people to that, uh, to the intensive interest of Christ for our salvation, we have to create uh, that atmosphere through uh, by the physicians, uh, by having uh, through the nurses and all helpers in the institution that is creating that atmosphere uh, through those, um, those means. And so it really goes at an individual level of those who make up the institution, whether or not they're going to produce that influence and will count the people to the intensive interest that Christ has. And so it's so the work that the institution has to work on to produce that. Um, and so it first start off, it first starts with the physicians, and then the nurses and, and all helpers. And so let's look more into that individual worker effort because <laughs> it's like a building block. The institution is made of, of uh, various workers that produce that influence. All right, so here um, we're going to look first look at the physician. It says here, the physician who proves himself worthy of being placed as leading physician in a sanitarium will do a grand work, but his work in religious lines should ever be of such a nature that the divine antidote for the relief of sin-burdened souls will be presented before the patients. All physicians should understand that such work should be done with tenderness and wisdom. In our sanitariums where mental patients are brought for treatment, the comforting words of the truth are spoken. To the afflicted one will often be the means of soothing the mind and restoring peace to the soul. And so here, here the physician is doing a, an important work and he must constantly keep in, in view the divine antidote for the relief of sin burdened souls. Because yes, he, he needs to address their physical or mental needs, but also he needs to, um, he can never forget a divine antidote that he has because he has access to a antidote that can deal with deeper. Oh, and yeah. so that is what he needs to access to, um, to, uh, be an effective means of restoring peace to the body, mind, and spirit. Without that, he can't, without using that divine an antidote, there is no total restoration that can occur. Amen. And um, that's what the world can't offer that. Um, <laughs> that's why we need our sanitariums that point people to Christ is really evangelism. Mm -hmm. um, even when you look at people who are interested or that promote health, but take that out of it, they might talk about, or they talk about the benefits of apples and all these different yeah. things, but when they don't have God in it, they're missing a big major point. So they're not going to have overall health spiritually, physically, and mentally because God's not in it. So they won't have the same rest as they will have mm. if they have Christ. And but don't they keep the Sabbath either. But they want to substitute those things by going into spiritualism, mm. like yoga and all these things, saying that they'll give them peace. But actually, it's like they're turning to the devil, and the devil's not going to give them peace. It's, they're going to continue to be tormented by the devil. So, um, God's way, it, it, it's it's all around health. So, and even in the hospitals today. They're not going to bring people to Christ because they're not a religious institution. And even so, you, it needs to all be God's way from physically Amen. and spiritually. Amen. Amen. So all of it. And um, as you said, the world can't offer that. And they, when God is kicked out, it's not going to be successful. But when God is in it, then the person is brought to Christ, and that's true evangelism. Amen. Amen. 
And so it's a, it's a special work uh, of ministry as well in our in working in our sanitariums. And it says here, um, and and I was gonna yeah. say. I was going to say that um, God always gives us reminders in Matthew 6, 33. He says, seek um, me first and all these things shall be added in unto us. And it is amazing how uh, we um, do not use that principle. But God said, if you seek me first. You know, um, so I am excited that the the mission and the purpose of of uh, the true sanitariums seek God's for God first, and um, that is how all should be. Amen. And Amen. That's the, same, um, the same reason that God has these sanitariums to be established is the same reason that God has Israel to be a light to the world. It wasn't just to hold, um, keep the light to themselves like they were the only ones to be saved. No, it was to share light, to be a blessing to the world, to point others to Christ too. Amen. Amen. Yes. Hi. Good evening. Good, good evening. Happy Sabbath. Everyone, I just wanted to say I I just really love and these uh, what we're doing every Sabbath evening, and through studying and just listening and reading reading um, medical ministry, it, I, it it just really dawned on me to just the characteristics of uh, of what the expectations are of the sanitarium versus what we have today, and. The true power of God rests with um, his sanitarians because when we go into the world system for help, God bless them, but there's still a lack there. You know, it, there's no true restoration of mind, body, and soul. We might get some physical help. We might get some drugs, you know, and all these things, but to be truly led to Christ, we're not going to really find that. We're not going to find that in the world system because it's like a drive through in and out, in and out, you know, and we're mm -hmm. not just not going to find it there. But with the Lord, what another thing that I, I found that was deep about this is that this health reform is also not just the Lord's healing, but it's his way of purifying a people to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. This is the true, true restoration and purifying us in mm -hmm. our health reforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So this is a work of purifying it work of, of I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as we work in, even as we work for others and as we seek to do the best and, and all that we say, think and do, and bring that, uh, have that influencer Christ, you know, that all benefits us as well. And um, as you said, the, the work of health reform is a, an ennobling work for us. You know, we benefit from that. Um, to, um, bless others or help others and react in blessing us because um we have to learn these different things. So then as we learn to share with others, we're being blessed. Amen. Amen. Carlene, Amen. check your mic. Check your mic. Carlene. Um, okay. Obviously it was off. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Great. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, so repeating that, as we um are seeking to bless others or helping them it reacts in blessing us because we are um being it's like a re reaction that comes right back because as we seek to help others we have to learn the different things to teach others and then we're learning more as we learn to share amen exactly amen yeah so it's a great work, uh, work for us and others. <laughs> Amen. Uh, yeah. So now it says here, physicians in our institutions have many weighty responsibilities. Their only safety is in keeping their thoughts and impulses under control of the great teacher. We have golden opportunities for doing good. They can guide, they can mold, they can uh, mold the many and varied minds which are brought in contact 
They should take a stand for God. Show men and women connected with the Institute how pure noble they may become. Show them that you have firm confidence in God, that he is your source of strength, and that you are resting wholly upon the promise. Fulfill your duty with promptness while claiming your heavenly father's help to overcome all weakness of character with the hand of faith, the grasping, the arm of divine power, put your whole being into the work, your work. So fulfill your duty with promptness and uh, point people, show people how they can become uh, like God mold, you know, use your influence to mold their minds after or, or point their minds to Christ to be molded and transformed by his power. So you can use your, uh, your, your influence. You have golden opportunities to do good in the transformation of lives and, uh, you know, in really pinning a pattern down. And um, that has a profound impact in, on them. <laughs> Yeah, it reminds me of a story, but we might talk about that a little later. Yeah, um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So um, there's this business around here that they have. Um, it's very interesting. They've been around here for over 100 years. But the interesting thing about this business. <laughs> okay, uh, around here, about an hour away, but still in, We're in the country. <laughs> still like not too far where we can go yeah. there <laughs> but anyway um the interesting thing is that they put god first in their business like on their um building you can see like bible text it says for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son or it has different bible texts i might not remember exactly which one but it's like believe in the lord jesus christ there's different bible texts that's um on their building on the outside and inside but um but the interesting thing was on their facebook page a customer gave a comment on the business and said that she really appreciated that when she and her husband got there early before they were quite open but they're almost open but they were already there doing their things that they do before they open um, one of the routine things they do is pray before they open and they invited their customers to, um, if they want to join them in prayer, which they did. And they really were blessed by such, a, um, were, were blessed by it. And we're like, that's why y'all been in business for over a hundred I mean, years, literally, over a hundred <laughs> years. I mean, yeah. that, that is amazing. And yeah that influence you see exactly that sincere sincerity in and um and their steadfastness to principles and christian principles that has a profound impact and like you're saying that when they saw that and when they experienced that it had a profound impact that they didn't forget no, they didn't forget. I, I mean, and, and when you go there, it's amazing, you know. Because you don't really that. see that. You don't see that today. When you go into Walmart, you don't see mm -hmm. prayer and all those things. Um, but it was interesting to see a business that put God first and how, um, well, they're not a non Adventist business, but we did give them um, our literature, like our magazine and a, and a Bible track. <laughs> yeah, amen. So hopefully they'll read it and learn even more truth. Amen. And and so this shows the the importance of, of you know of being that influence and and being the light. It's like really, it's very um, it's a blessing to be a light, not to let like hide your light, but even in business, let your light shine because it's not like you don't have to hide it and sh hide that you're a Christian and all those things, let it shine. And you want to, um, when you let it shine through all these other ways, like even in business, you're, I mean, it's a means of evangelizing, like someone else can be impressed and believe in Christ himself. Amen. Amen. And so I think that, that, you know, like you were talking about that business right there, that should be uh, like a model even for our businesses 
um, we should, we can a lot, we can have times, you know, when we have Bible studies and in the beginning of the work day, you can invite the community, you can invite customers to that. And, uh, you know, that can be a means of having an effective, um, outreach to them and have, you know, the practically experience, um, you know, true worship of God. And even in the sanitarium have, um, have songs and prayer and a whole lot. Like it's a great way to minister with them. I mean, so profound. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that even hearing that story was amazing. I think it and... was very impressive because I, I don't see that a lot. And to go to a business that 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 has the Bible text on the building and also on their Facebook page about the prayer. Um, that was just a comment that someone made on there, but that's just one of their routines they do. Oh, you mind. You mind. And it's a fifth generation business. So it's been around for over a hundred years. It started in 1919. Yeah. Yeah. And if you found in fact in the agriculture role as well. <laughs> yeah. But it's a lot yeah. of um Obviously, being connected with nature, they remember God a whole lot because mm -hmm. it's God who makes the things to grow. And to see that every day is amazing. Amen. I mean, they're a little place, but you, you want to imagine <laughs> how, how much uh, impact they had on the, the whole agriculture world through their things. And, and the amazing. interesting thing is, as putting God first, God put them and made them the head because their seed is actually a seed that is really is a common variety of collard green. It's called Morris Heading. And Morris Heading was founded by Elisha Morris, who um, was the founder of the, the Christian business. And um, it's amazing how God, they put God first and how God set them as the head. Amen. That, that, that's amazing. It never fails. Um, <laughs> yeah. And there's even other um, businesses that are like examples of that. And so we need to pattern that, you know, our business after the, that biblical model, that Christian model as well. Um, yeah. And now, all right. So we saw how the Christian position is to be that witness. Now, what about, oh, let's look at the ministry in, um, um, No, uh, okay, let me, I can change the slide. All right, here it is, ministry and patient care. I already have it now. All right, um, okay, so now, let's look at the ministry and patient care for for everyone, doctors, nurses, and helpers, all involved. It says all, right here, all nurses and helpers are to give treatments and perform other kinds of service in such a delicate, reverential way and withal so solidly, thoroughly, and cheerfully that the sanitarium will prove a haven of rest. And so in everything is to be done so, so carefully, so re delicately, reverently, <laughs> in a way that it will give it be a power for good. You know, so imagine if a, if a, if a worker came to them and says, I'm going to give you hydrotherapy today. And they said, come on, sit right here. And then start splashing pots around, and, and then they get whoo, and they get burned with the water of a sweat. Yeah, I mean, you 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 need to be treated, you know, reverential, delicate, and and cheerfully, solidly, thoroughly, you know, not oh, and the patients oh, like and just so much anguish. <laughs> yeah have to be careful like not slamming the door on them yeah but um go ahead yeah go ahead <laughs> i was just saying because some industries when <laughs> everyone's not really quite nice, nice but um in this people need to be um uh, be reverent and <laughs> exactly <laughs> and and all businesses that we have and just imagine if you're the Customer. If you're on the other end, if you're the sick person, you're the customer, and you have pain, you have a, um, you're you have a cut, you know, you're you're running one day and you went 
fell off the heel, blam, 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 hit a rocket and you bust your leg. Well, oh, this is going to hurt really badly. And you got that wrapped up. But imagine it's somebody rude and thorough and careless and he came in and wrapped that thing up. You know, you're going to be in a lot of pain. He's going to make that pain so much more worse just because of your... Or just let you needlessly sit there too long. Like, okay. So, um, like you're in, you're suffering and they have you sitting for two hours or three hours. It's like, <laughs> that's very um unprofessional because whenever you're having to sit in your suffering condition and just like, it seems like they don't care about you. You just don't let me sit here. Like, I'm hurting. Yeah. <laughs> like, why aren't you coming to... Um, Coming to help. It sounds like people that go to the emergency <laughs> room, they just sit there for till they die. <laughs> well, they probably feel Hopefully. like it. yeah. <laughs> I, and you, you hear a lot of stories about that, you know, how they just they waited for all that time. I mean, you think of um a towing service, you know, like a big tow, like triple A one um recently actually, my dad was driving to the dump and he dumped some trash off. He have an older truck. Uh, it, it's big, powerful. It works nice, but it's old and uh, it broke down. <laughs> um, but thank God it broke down at a gas station on the side of the road. And um, we went over there. We had some tools. We're like, this is going to be a quick fix. We're going to be out and you know back home pretty soon. You know, it's quick. And it just happened, you know, right at a tail next over. So we, it was no problem. We're going to take care of that really quick. So we brought the tools, went over there, fixed it up. We thought, and then boom, we went up again. It was, we had problems with the belt and some other stuff. We thought we were trying to fix it earlier and we thought we had fixed it, but there was a part that was not fixed properly in there and it, and it caused problems. Anyway, it, we broke down and uh, we were trying to work it out. We had some people, you know, they came over, yeah, 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 yeah. And they, they looked at it and they, we thought we had it worked out and then boom, it didn't work out. They were like, oh, okay. It's getting dark now. We say, oh, let's call it AAA. And, uh, then I wait for one hour. Yeah, because they said forty-five to forty to fifty-nine minutes. Yeah. Then we wait for two hours. It felt like we were forgotten. <laughs> and then we waited for three hours, and so we're out there for a total of five hours. And I guess we tried to fix it right ourselves. Two hours, and then three hours waiting. And yeah, that felt bad. But eventually we got it and it was kind of funny because the truck was like too, like so big. <laughs> anyway, it barely made, but made it. Um, but here, I mean, that was just an example. I mean, if you think that was bad, <laughs> that's just, you know, bring your car back home and we're close to home. Um, you imagine if you were in need of help in a situation, you're in pain, you have, um, you know, so careless, so irreverent, so indelicate treatment by the, yeah. by the institution. It's like, yeah. it's like, it feels like needlessly causing pain because mm -hmm. Um, if someone's sick and they come to uh, the sanitarium and then we put them off like there's no big deal, we'll we'll get we can't even talk to you till 25 minutes. <laughs> and then uh, then 25 minutes come and they say, oh, wait, two more hours or wait an hour. <laughs> it's like, what? Like, why can't y'all help me? Like, I see like these, there's workers here and like y'all just looking over me like I'm not in pain. Like, but Christ, that's not the way he deals with things. When when his children need help, those angels come so fast and um they're right there for you. But a lot of times the people on earth, I mean, they take forever. Like they drag their feet. And, they feel like, like they have like so much power. I know, it's like, well, yeah, like... I mean that's amazing like <laughs> exactly because um, it did not feel good to be left um so long without triple a coming like because we had called them like right before nine and then by the time they came it was almost one o'clock it was about 12 yeah and, and they yeah, how they stream you along is they said oh, it's gonna be 45 minutes oh we're, we're coming in 50 minutes and then we're coming and then it's like a whole hour later yeah, yeah. it was 11 near 12 o'clock and then by the time it got on the truck because it was struggling it was getting later exactly. because the truck was kind of too small to bring our truck back home but yeah. it just barely made it <laughs> yeah <laughs> barely um yeah so here is it's very important to really uh you know act in in that in a way that 
It's pleasing to the patients. And this is in the last one. It says, in your care of the sick act tenderly, kindly, faithfully that you may have a converting influence upon them. You have a need of the grace of Christ in order to properly represent the service of Christ. And so, you know, if you act you know, faithfully, uh, kindly, and tenderly, you can win, you know, and have a converting influence on them. And that is really important. Really important. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have a have this influence. Now, how can we create a winning influence for the truth in our institutions? And what are some things that can lessen that influence? So first of all, how can we create that influence? You know, practically, uh, we know we know about you know how we should represent Christ and you know things of that nature. Um, but Practically, uh, what are some ways we can create a winning influence for the truth in our institution? Then, what are some things that can lessen that influence? Now, um, what are some ways we can create, first of all? Um, you know, I would say that, you know, having that kindness, tenderness, and, and cheerfulness and dealing with the patients rightly is one of the ways we can create a winning influence for the truth. Yeah, because if you go and treat them like that, like so indifferently, um, being irreverent and um, taking your <laughs> taking too long to like they have an appointment, don't even show up. Then after it won't take the patient too many times to be treated like that. So they're like they're done. They're not coming back. You hear them talk about. <laughs> then they go to their friends. And they say, you know. I was at, I was at um, this health center out there <laughs> in whatever place, and I was, you know, they were. I was sitting there for so long, and I was in pain. They had no care for me, and then the the, the other person's like, "Really, man? Really?" And they're like, "Yeah, man. They're they're just they just have like, oh, you know, they're <laughs> you know, it's just gonna have a." You, you, a bad influence is going to have a rippling effect on people as well as good good influence so as you know, if you're if you have a good influence a winning influence you're going to tell my friends you know this is the best place yeah i was there and they took care of me right then you know i i didn't have to wait long you know was, you know they took care of me promptly and they <laughs> really care for me yes did you ever find out why triple a was so slow <laughs> uh well <laughs> well so, um, yeah go ahead <laughs> well <laughs> when when the um when the trucker came or the tow trucker came, he told us that um they didn't let him know, Triple A didn't let him know that we were on the side of well, at a gas station, like broke down till ten forty five and we called them at eight something, almost nine o'clock, and they didn't let them know. And then they lied to us, telling us that they were having so much, like they were booked up, like all the towers were busy towing other people and they couldn't find anyone. Yeah. But he was not busy because he didn't even know till like 1045 and he came all the way like 40 minutes away. So like right after he found out, he started preparing to head on out. And that's why he got there so late was because he didn't even know. Exactly. Okay, so. well, the reason why I said that is because there was a reason why he was late. He wasn't <laughs> late because he didn't want to help you. No. He was yeah. Because he didn't know. Well, it's the yeah. same thing. When you go to an office, a doctor's office or something, you want to be waiting on right now. I'm in pain. I want to be seen right now. Well, that, <laughs> that's what you want. But sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes there are really circumstances that cause you to have to wait. And I think if that's the case, then you have to be extra kind to people when you have to make them wait. Yeah. Um, and, and one thing I, I learned from, you know, I got from this section, where I think we're going to go over that soon, is you know, I think... You know, yeah, there, there's times we're busy and there's times, you know, the person may be working on some really, really critical case and they might not be able to get that case over there, but uh, they should have, we should have like people that can help out, like assistants. Yes, because that, um, that can help them out. Like that's how they treated us, but 
the AAA it believes I believe that they could have contacted him earlier so he could have been home earlier. But um anyway, it's kind of like we don't want to treat other people like that when we have a business. We want to treat other people the way we want to be treated. So try to have things orchestrate in a way that we don't have to have a long wait. We can kind of like um, have an assistant if the physician isn't able to make it for some reason, like legitimately not able to make it, not just say, I don't feel like going there, mm-hmm. but um, have an assistant physician go and help them out and explain um, why the physician wasn't able to make it. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing is explaining why they couldn't be there. Yes. Understand there are times when you cannot do everything all yes. the time. Exactly. But mm-hmm. when you do have to be delayed or you can't make it, that you show the attitude of sympathy and 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 uh well I couldn't make it so you know you had to wait. No that's exactly. not what you yeah want. that's true but, because yeah, we have yeah. That's yeah, that's true because we have to be patient and wait because there's certain things that are legitimate that we'll have to wait for. And that's why um, the Bible says, here's the patience of the saints because there's certain things that we have to endure patiently and cheerfully because um, like trials, we have to wait patiently till Jesus comes. Exactly. So, um, so you, yeah. you want to be, you want to be kind, you want to be sympathetic so even on the other flip side you yeah. still be patient even if the person's unable to make it yeah. just still be patient but if they wanted to contact doctor such and such in the hospital and doctor such and such is working on a trauma traumatic case he didn't expect that case to come in but there was massive acts that happened you know there's a lot of people coming in they really heard and the, you know, most of the doctors are tied up in that. You know, they expect that situation. Well, you have the regular appointments you had scheduled, but you know, if, especially for the, you can have you have more than one person in the entire institution. There's several, and so you know, like you said, be sympathetic with them, and whatever can be done without that physician, because hopefully you have more people with that same capabilities. You can't have one or two physicians with you know in the whole thing. You know with you know, they only, they're the only ones with all the capabilities, you know, you should have more than one people. And so what can't be done by Dr. A can be done by Dr. B. Yeah. And then um, it's very important, like you said, is to explain why was there the delay? Cause then it will tell the patient like, Oh, I see why really they really care about me. It wasn't because they forgotten me, but such and such had to happen. That was just a really that bad was just an accident. emergency yeah. that someone else was in a dire Situ- more dire situation than their case and to explain certain things to them to um so then they feel like they weren't forsaken <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah let's read this uh, quote here that talks about that so i can read that right here somebody on zoom can read it There, <clears throat> there have been defects in the management at the sanitarium The patients have felt that, and it's gone. I don't know what. It's gone. um, Okay, here it goes. Okay. There have been defects in the management at the sanitarium. The patients have felt that they were not treated as they should be. Appointments have been made which have not been filled. Such failure as these will greatly militate militate against the influence of a physician. The patient will not be often, the patient will not be often thus disappointed without feeling bitterness of soul and mind. 192 paragraph five so yeah it's just um being if you're not able to make it don't not just show up because it shows well this patient this physician must not be legitimate because i had this appointment and he's not even there yeah. <laughs> like okay i'll i'll meet you at three o'clock and three o'clock comes and all the way to four o'clock and it's like 
he's not there he's not there no like explanation. no explanation why he didn't make it it just seems like having an appointment with, with someone and then they don't show up it's like well was the person really serious <laughs> yeah you, you get that even in business so it's like, yeah i'm gonna be there i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that and you're like okay and it know. tells on the person like they must they're not serious yeah. <laughs> it's like well you know you told me this you told me then and then you're still not and then you're obviously not gonna and then know, the patient yeah. drove to the place and they're like wait he's not here and then and then it says they, they develop a feeling of bitterness and then you know that you know that spirit of bitterness you know they go you know, i go to that i go to um vibrant health <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> i hope that's not a name so no one would let me say i go to this health center okay yeah town. you just made up the name I, I just made so a name, but, if there is yeah, a name it's, yeah, not, it's not vibrant yeah. health <laughs> <laughs> But I, I go to the, I go to the uh, health center in such and such a place, and um, you know, I was there. I made a point with Doctor A, and Doctor A didn't come. I waited there for two hours, and he never made my appointment. And then I came again, and Doctor A didn't come. And then he did come later on, and and he only spent three minutes with me. Or something like that. <laughs> and then, I mean, that's but gonna. Things that happen in the uh, traditional medical system because I know of someone who broke a bone and the hospital around here could not um, fit so you know fit the bone set the bone so they put her all the way to a hospital that was further away and then she ended up waiting like eight hours all together till her bone was set yeah eight so, hours in excruciating pain but even the <laughs> excruciating pain for eight hours i mean there's uh, you were busy but there's ways and there's things we gotta do to take care of these really big cases so we don't have bitterness i mean they're bitter how how do we know about it yeah they were mad they were mad that's how we knew about that's it. how we knew about because um they told us about it. it took eight hours till her bone got set and they were mad about it and that's how we know about it but to have a business that represents christ we don't want our patients to be bitter over something that's no big deal. Actually. We can prevent that. <laughs> exactly. And so and I think, I mean, for those on Zoom, I mean, don't you think that's possible? You know, there's ways, you know, for that, you know, where are your comments on that? And if you have any more, I heard mm -hmm. some comments, but if you have any more. <laughs> well, that's, <clears throat> that's why I love um, oh, yeah. God so much one of the reasons is because you can always talk to him there's no delay you if i have anything on my mind or any problem or whatever you can talk to him immediately and what if he would put us off i would not like that <laughs> so god knows himself that that that's important that he's always there when we need him and I can remember way back when I went to uh, the hospital and um, I was in, quote unquote, the emergency room. Well, they take your insurance. They take that first. <laughs> and then uh, they'll say, well, I got to take all the other critical patients first. Well, anyway. I ended up being probably in the emergency room for maybe six hours. I was highly upset. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is not a care. <laughs> and it made an indelible imprint in my mind. I was like, if this is how you take care of the sick. And I'm looking around and I saw people sick. We all sick because <laughs> we were all in the emergency room and we all waiting. And that is like a herd. I call it. I mean, it was just I did not like it. I, I never liked it. And I can I can attest that that is something that um I pray that when we do have our institution, that we are able to, um, with God's help, um, be be uh, be prompt with the patient 
and not have the patient wait six hours. That's unacceptable. Unacceptable. Exactly. exactly. And I think one of the things that causes that problem is the whole the whole way they're set up. Um, you know, they have large, really large hospitals in, in the city or at least big buildings. And some even have problems staffing some of them, but uh, they have these large hospitals and uh, in the other areas and other rural areas, they don't have anything. And so you have, uh, you have a lot of people from all these areas just coming to one center and that, and then you, you know, you can't, yeah, a lot of these, even though they're big hospitals, they don't have all the staff they need to run a, such a massive atrocity. And see so if all these people come from all these areas, and that adds to their problem, you know. But the what we see in the blueprint is that you have many smaller ones in many areas, and so you know one should be so strained where um, you, I mean, you should have, um, you should do it in created where um, you're, you're not so strained in that just one area. And, uh, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why I believe smaller centers in many areas is uh, really important. Yeah. And um, my brother, Nehemiah, he, uh, he had a comment that he, he said, and I'll just repeat it, was that um, also when we are going to have a meeting, uh, a AAGE meeting, um, you probably noticed that we were on the, in a different place that we were, well, you probably didn't know this, because, but anyway, I'll just say it now. We were in a different place than we were intending to be because something happened. Someone did not meet their appointment. Uh, we we're at the um, building that we were going to rent and no one showed up and no one ever called to tell us. We called them a lot of times but the meeting was about to go live stream. And so we were on emergency mode. So we had to um, go to our aunt's house. Um, and that's where we had the meeting because we didn't have time to even go all the way back home to do it. <laughs> exactly. And so, and we're, we're there for you know, higher speed internet because we didn't have. Yeah, that's you know, why we were there. And, you know, the point was already made, you know, already <laughs> agreed on. And, uh, that ever came and so you know that's importance of you know being prompt and meeting point, uh, appointments yeah. and so would you i won't ever really go back to that building to rent anything because they're not dependable because when you want to be there when they have you have a appointed time they say okay we'll be open then for you and then they don't show up it's like it's okay like, well they're not i'm not going back there exactly exactly and so um you can imperil the reputation of the institution through these things. It says here, uh, would you like to read that right there? The sick pay for their treatments in order that they may recover health. But if they are disappointed again and again, the reputation of the sanitarium will be imperiled. This evil must be corrected. The attention that has been promised must be given to the patients or the physician breaks the confidence of the patients in his word. If the leading physician cannot possibly meet the appointment, he shall have his associate physician meet it for him, explaining to the patient the cause of his absence. And that is Medical Ministry, page 192, paragraph 6. So that's, um, if the physician can't make it, someone else should be there in replacement. And that's like what Cornwall was yeah, saying. Yeah, like Cornwall was saying mm -hmm. how they should explain why he couldn't make it because there's legitimate things that happen and his vehicle could have broke down or anything could have happened and he wasn't able to get there. Or he could have had an emergency with someone else because um, another traumatic case happened where he wasn't able to meet the appointment. So all those things should be explained to the patient because we don't want the patient to get bitter for no reason. Exactly. So here's practical advice. Yeah. Really practical <laughs> tips and advice. And um, it says here, unless the physician or sanitariums are men of thorough habits, unless they attend promptly to their duties, their work will become a reproach and the Lord's appointed agencies will lose their influence. By course of negligence to duty, the physician humiliates the great physician of whom he is, should be a representative. 
Strict hours should be kept with all patients, high or low. No careless neglect should be allowed in any of the nurses. Ever be true to your word. Prompt in meeting your appointments for this means much to the sick. The sick should not be compelled to wait when they need advice and relieve. Ne never should the physician neglect his patients. He should be quick. He should have quick penetrating judgment and should carry into the sick room a gentle atmosphere. He should not be cold, recent, or hesitating, but would and should cultivate those qualities which exert a soothing influence over the suffering ones. They want more than looks. They want kind, hopeful words. The doctor should be ready to give them cheerful, reassuring words, words spoken from the heart and wisdom, showing that he understands the cases of those under his care. Thus, this will inspire a restfulness and confidence even at the first interview. These are really important. We see that he should be, he should not um, be slackful and and is dealing he with should, patients. In the first interview, you should have their confidence. He should do a thorough work too, like not just skimming the surface with his work, be thorough. Mm -hmm. And um, what I mean by that is not trying to rush in and out by not spending the proper time with the patient. Like, okay, put your feet in here for two seconds. Okay, throw it in the alarm for one second. Oh, I'm done. And <laughs> gone. <laughs> That's a good point too there. <laughs> Exactly. Because it, it's, um, there's certain things that you're quick with, which is good, but um, but be thorough when it comes to the patient because they're sick and they want they want to be properly treated without being treated in a negligent way or look like exactly. they might think. And, 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 and then right in that quote, we just read the last paragraph, it said that he should have a quick penetrating judgment and should carry into the sick room a... a um, an atmosphere that that uh, is a, a peaceful one, mm -hmm. and so he should. Um, Everything should be cheerful, not um, not sh not just going exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so uh, also we saw that a negligence it reproaches uh, the great physician, and so on his part, if he's negligent and, and he. Uh, and he's not true to duty, he's going to humiliate the greatest physician. And we don't want to do that. <laughs> we want to be true representatives. Um, yeah. Because when, when we look at the life of Christ, there was no patient that he saw as not important to him. He healed them all. So when, when the blind man came and they're like, Shh, be quiet, he, he didn't be, he didn't, well, actually, the blind man there was told to be quiet. But they cried out more, like, have mercy on us. Jesus didn't just say, like, I don't have time for you. I got all these other things <laughs> yeah. to do. Uh -huh. But he went and, like, what will you have me to do? And they said that we may see. We want to see. And he had them see as a result. But um, so looking at the way that Jesus did it is the way that we are to do it. We are not to put people off because they might look like they're poor and we'll be like, well, I don't have time for the poor man. I'm just going to focus <laughs> on the rich person. I'm going to put my attentions on him because I'm going to get He's more money fun. from him yeah. and neglect the poor person. That's not what Christ would do. He will um, give attention to all the rich and the poor. Mm. All will receive help if they want it. Amen. Amen. And so, we're, again, you know, the medical missionary in the medical missionary work, we need to follow example of Christ and practically uh, exemplify that in all that we do. Amen. Now, what is God calling for now? You know, we see we need to be, there, there's many opportunities for ministry in, in our hospitals and sanitariums, many, many, many opportunities. And we have to improve those opportunities and use those opportunities and create a winning influence, um, which have a compelling um, uh, appeal to all the patients that come in contact with our medical institutions. Uh, but now, what is God calling for now? What does God want? And um, so I can read this quote here. Ernest Devo 
reluctant young people are needed to enter the work of God as nurses, as these young men and women use conscientiously the knowledge they gain, they will increase in capability and become better and better qualified to be the Lord's helping hand. They may become successful missionaries pointing souls to the lamp of God, who taketh away the sin of the world, who and who can save both soul and body? The Lord wants wise men and women acting in the capacity of nurses to comfort and help the sick and suffering. Oh, that all who are afflicted could be ministered to by Christ-like physicians and nurses who could help them to place their weary, pain-wracked bodies in the care of the great healer and faith looking to him for restoration. Amen. So not only physicians, but nurses. And it says here that, you know, oh, how that all are afflicted could be ministered by Christ like physicians and nurses, physicians and nurses that are, um, you know, trained to do this work, uh, according to, uh, according to the blueprint, you know, and, and really being with the patients and, and really ministering to them and taking these opportunities, you know, I mean, it's going to have a profound impact on their health just being around these folk. I mean, just being around these folk in the atmosphere of peace is going to have a profound impact on the patients. And so God is calling for earnest, devoted young people and older alike to do this work, be a true Christian medical missionary worker. And that is what God is calling for now. And, um, it's a work that carries a, a powerful influence for, for good and uplifting and um, an influence that no other work could have. And that is why God is calling for people to enter into this work, to do this work wholeheartedly. And you know, what is the result of rightly representing the truth in our institutions? Um, what will be the result of rightly representing it? And... and you know, we can't just, it's interesting, it's rightly represented because we can have, you know, we have, a, you know, Bible text in here and this and that, you know, in words, but then when we actually go there, it's just completely different. So we have to rightly represent, not only in words, but in deeds. So now as a result of rightly representing the truth in our institutions, um, what is the result? Let's read it. <laughs> Somebody can read that uh, on, on Zoom. If it's not too small. The medical missionary work is as the right hand and arm to the third angel's message, which must be proclaimed to a fallen world. And physicians, managers, and workers in any line in acting faithfully their part are doing the work of the message. From them, the sound of the truth will go forth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In this work, the heavenly angels uh, bear a part. They awaken spiritual joy and melody in the hearts of those who have been freed from suffering and joy and thanksgiving to God arise from many hearts that have been, that have received the precious truth. Medical Missionary 118, paragraph four. They are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, presenting the beauty of his life in their own example of earnest self-sacrifice and labor. Medical Missionary 196, paragraph one. Every sincere Christian bows to Jesus as the true physician of souls. When he stands by the bedside of the afflicted, there will be many not only converted, but healed. If through judicious ministration, the patient is led to give his soul to Christ and to bring his thoughts 
into obedience to the will of God, a great victory is gained. Mm-hmm. Medical Missionary 197, paragraph three. So that's the whole goal of the when God has his sanitarium to be started mm-hmm. is to win souls to him and win through the work of the physician and the nurse and the, all the workers that work for the patient, when, when that patient receives Christ, a great victory has been gain, gained wow. and the angels start singing in heaven. <laughs> Amen. And so through these agencies, through these institutions, the sound of truth can go forth to every nation, kindred tongue and people. And so that it, it, it plays a very important role in the proclamation of the angel's message. And so that is very important why we need institutions that truly and rightly represent Christ and rightly represent these Christian principles and don't hide it. Um, and this have a, even the workers and the physicians and the managers all need to exert that influence. Yes. And this is one of um, God's means in spreading the the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This is one of his means of doing that is in the health work as using it as the right arm to the gospel. Amen. Amen. Is there any question or comments on today's uh, discussion? I think that was really um, good and uh, informative on how we can deal with uh, various things and still maintain a good influence. Is there any more questions or comments? It's beautiful to think that the angels of God are are with us when we do his work. And God himself (laughs) is there by the bedside. It's so spiritual and it's, uh, it's just the most wonderful work. And may God help us to work with, uh, with him and um, proclaim um, the true right way. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, um, everyone, for joining us. And uh, that was really a good uh, discussion. And uh, I think at this time, we're going to close out with prayer. Would uh, someone like to close out with prayer? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you so much for this opportunity and this privilege to come before you in prayer. We thank you for being God and we thank you for blessing us all to make it to the meeting today. We thank you for all the things that you taught us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and understanding in the things of God and help us to have the strength and the power from on high to live according to the things that you're teaching us. Lord, we thank you for knowing all the things that we all have need of. And we thank you for these young people, the willingness to go forward and do your work. And I pray, dear Lord, that we will all become medical missionaries. The um, the work that now will be the only work that we'll be able to do in this time of trouble and to bring so many souls into your kingdom. Lord, forgive us for all of our sins and shortcomings and be with everyone that's on this line. I pray that you will bless every family. Be with us, God, and keep us and protect us from all manner of hurt, harm, and danger, seen and unseen. And help us to be that light of the world that you called us to be, the salt of the earth, going forth and bringing souls into the kingdom of heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 I'm so glad you joined us for today's map. And join us next time, uh, next week, uh, next Sabbath for another map and we're going to be talking about we're going to be actually in uh, section 11 and we're talking about the sanitarium family and so this is a cool one the sanitarium family and so here it's referred to family and so um has a lot of a lot of good 
counsel and instruction for us here um, in that discussion. So now, let other people know about it. Uh, you can feel free to share the link uh, with others and um, join us again next Sabbath at seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time and be blessed and be ready for to join the discussion. Uh, give your comments. And uh, so I invite you to study the book and, and stay in that section so you can be ready to give your comments and, and um, your thoughts on, on these very important topics. Um, so may God bless you and hope you have a blessed week and hope you've had a blessed Saturday.